Hello everyone and welcome. Uh, my name is Marianne Hogeveen. Uh, I'm a staff data scientist at CityBlock Health and I would like to uh, talk to you about uh, how at CityBlock we're trying to develop the language of collaboration for healthier neighborhoods. So let's talk terminology first. What is a Marianne? Well, uh, a Marianne in this case, I can't speak for all Mariannes, started out in physics, uh, moved towards applied maths, uh, found her way through all sorts of uh, programs and data science jobs uh, as a data farmer at some point and uh, ended up now uh, in data science at City Block Health. And uh, thankfully, Marianne's also have uh, some time for miscellaneous fun occasionally. Uh, I like to give talks about hobbies related to my work, but not uh, exactly work. Um, but, you know, there's work uh, that Marianne has to do. Uh, so, for example, a couple of months ago, I had shared this update with my team. Uh, follow up on callback times PR, work on model training pipeline, fire chat, town hall. Uh, this is all, yeah, most of you will probably know most of these words. Uh, but, you know, for the regular person, there might be something to unpack here. So, what is a PR? Well, you know, probably it means a pull request. Um, model training pipeline, you also know what that means, but you know, uh, others might uh, need explanation there. Town halls are things that, you know, are very uh, common in especially startups to, to have as a company. So um, you can kind of see there are three groups of people that, uh, that tend to use these words. So I'm a part of several uh, communities that use uh, certain words. Um, and that's kind of what I uh, want to talk about in this talk. So our goals here are first, well, uh, I mentioned healthier neighborhoods in the title, but uh, let's learn a bit more about that. Uh, and then how can we build in general supportive technology? Uh, and I have my own personal secret goal, of course, uh, and that's getting jargon, the word jargon out of the doghouse. So the healthier neighborhoods, um, that's, uh, that's quite, a, quite a, a, an important topic that's been in the news quite a bit. Uh, so here you see uh, NYU uh, made a tool where you can see uh, a lot of, sort of health uh, measures uh, throughout cities in the US. Um, and you can see here that your, uh, with, like, the area where you live can have actually quite uh, a severe impact on your, in this case, this is your life expectancy. And the differences between like blocks almost, like which block you live uh, can mean like 10 years difference in your life expectancy at birth. And if you look at uh, health, people tend to talk about behavioral changes you could make or, you know, genetic makeup, uh, all sorts of things. But this suggests that maybe uh, there's uh, something underlying to uh, unpack here. So things that actually uh, can matter a lot are, for example, air quality. Uh, you can live on a block with trees and no heavy traffic and that changes uh, the air quality a lot. Um, but also, uh, well, you may have seen in the news things about food deserts. So access to, uh, to uh, fresh food is very important. Uh, and transportation. So if you have convenient transportation and can uh, get to work and also visit the doctor, um, then that makes your health uh, a lot easier to manage. But there can also be uh, socioeconomic factors uh, that are very important to health and that are not necessarily tied to that location. So let's say uh, in, a, in a certain area there's uh, people living there who like experience discrimination uh, when they access healthcare uh, that that can have a big effect on uh, that can have a big effect on their outcomes and their life expectancy but it wouldn't necessarily be tied to that location so uh, at city block uh, what we want to do is uh, uh, provide a like build a, a healthcare uh, system build a, a a way of delivering healthcare that isn't too medicalized and that doesn't just look at uh, the very uh, the very medically specialized causes of health, but that also looks at 
all these social uh, determinants of your health. Uh, and we try to kind of uh, put, the, put our members uh, central to, to their healthcare. Uh, they, they are in the driver's seat and you know, they, they know best uh, what their situation is and what the issues are that they face. And our teams are multidisciplinary and uh, support, uh, support the member and advise the member uh, in, you know, on the path to better health. So we can, we can do this in a holistic way. You know, uh, someone looking at it from one uh, specialization will see something as the cause of an issue, but someone coming in from uh, another perspective might, might know might identify other uh, other levers to pull that uh, you know that can give us a better a better picture overall. So what's very important um, for these care for these interdisciplinary care teams is that they are able to communicate well with each other without uh, misunderstanding. So broadly speaking, if you look at uh, where gaps in care can can happen, is when there is a handoff from one team to another or from one person in a team to another. Uh, and that's, that's the, the, the place where, you know, one person has built up uh, a picture of uh, what's going on with a member and needs to as efficiently as possible transfer the important information to the person they're handing off to. Um, so if we want to support uh, these teams in doing that, uh, one important thing to do is to minimize the burden of documentation because more burden of documentation means that, you know, it's, uh, there's, there's more of a chance to try to do it quickly and it has to like, not, uh, not be a very hard thing to do. Uh, and we also want to encourage best practices in uh, how uh, things are documented and how they are communicated what to include and how to formulate things, for example. And what's also very um, interesting here is that we have care teams that uh, include people, you know, from very, uh, uh, from very well-vetted well uh, medical or behavioral backgrounds, but also people from very mixed backgrounds. Um, and they can be uh, in a position where they understand the members' needs more from a perspective of coming from the same community and they could be uh, really effective translators uh, to you know socialize themes that our members are uh, actually uh, actually care about so as a tech person in this organization how can we uh, support this uh, how can we support this communication so one thing that you can do, of course, is try to uh, build tools that help reduce superficial variability. Uh, yeah, it, it's much easier to see things and to read things more efficiently if they're kind of always look a little bit the same. Uh, we also want to encourage brevity and precise language. So, you know, reducing this documentation burden, again, making it easier to parse. Uh, and we also want to allow ideas and concepts to propagate. You know, um, a, a care team member from one uh, background uh, should be able to uh, propagate all their ideas and their insights to uh, other members of the care team. So in short, uh, what we are trying to do here is uh, supporting care teams in forming a discourse community. So discourse community is basically uh, a group of people who have like, shared goals uh, and develop through that shared language. So that can be Benedict Cumberbatch fans. They seem to have like terms to describe themselves that are unique to them. Uh, preppers also have a lot of, lot of specialized terms that only they use. And for example, uh, if you look at physicists, uh, the shared language can be, you know, it can be terminology, but it can also be math, for example. And actually a discourse community can be quite small. So this is a message that uh, my boss sent to me. So we're in a way, you could say a discourse community of two. And here's that same message later. Uh, and actually there's a lot of messages that are exactly like this. So what does this mean? Uh, well, this is the uh, emoji that we call cat shocked. But actually what this means is, Marianne, I think you switched your notifications off again because you're late for a meeting. And it's basically that meaning is, is always the same. 
And we, like both of us, know exactly what this means. So what you see here is discourse communities uh, developing jargon. And jargon, if you look it up, it tends to have a very negative definition. So often disapproving or um, yeah, used by a particular profession or group of people, fine, fine. And difficult for others to understand. That, that already sounds not great. Try to avo avoid using too much technical jargon. Yeah, so that's, um, you know, that's, that, that doesn't sound like a, a thing that you want to do. But why do I want to uh, develop jargon at CityBlock? Well, it has some advantages. It does convey a lot of information uh, in, in a short, uh, in, in a small number of words. Uh, so it's, very, it's a very efficient way of, of conveying information within a group of people who understand it well. Um, and also, you know, it has a very well-defined meaning. It's very nice if you have terms that convey a lot of information that everyone within that group understands to mean that one very particular thing. So it reduces uh, confusion that you might have if you had to uh, explain it fully. And another thing is, um, for example, it can be a way of uh, reflecting your values. So we call uh, our members, we call them members, not patients. And that's uh, a very conscious choice. So uh, we want to view uh, our members, not just from this one medical perspective, but as a whole human being uh, who is you know, the CEO of their own health, who is in the driver's seat, has views and opinions, and uh, a lot of you know, information that, uh, that we also need to take into account. And also very importantly, everyone who works at CityBlock learns all these reasons during the first weeks of onboarding. So everyone understands this whole picture that uh, whenever we use the word member among each other, we all have this, this piece of information of like why, why this is important to call them members. Um, but, so this is an example uh, of, um, of jargon being developed, you know, by the whole company and being socialized throughout, but it can also be the other way around. Our care teams are also developing jargon as they go. Um, other care teams in the past have done so, and that has become, you know, medical jargon or social jargon. And you can see here, for example, uh, you can have a note somewhere where you say, all right, uh, I want to help the spouse of a member eliminate some of the stress they're experiencing as a caregiver. Uh, but you could actually summarize this as saying, help the spouse reduce caregiver strain. And caregiver strain is something that you see a lot in, uh, in, all, our, uh, in all our notes, because you know, it's something that is just very important. Uh, we have our member, but you know, they have uh, people in their, uh, you know, environment that might take care of them. And it's very important that we realize that those people uh, can, can get stressed and can experience strain because of their caregiving duties. So what we want to do actually is look at that sort of spontaneous development of jargon, uh, like find out where it happens and how it happens and try to promote that. So um, yeah, first thing we have to do is of course uh, detect it. Like, what is jargon? So um, I gave a sort of a positive definition before that it you know contains a lot of information um, and also that it has a very well defined meaning. There are other things that tend to be properties of jargon, not hundred percent. They tend to be noun chunks, um, like caregiver strain, uh, those are two nouns. Um, and they tend to be lexical, meaning that the meaning of the, of the total is, uh, you cannot derive that from the individual meanings of the composite words. So you can use that sort of, uh, those sort of things that tend to be associated with jargon to find it. Um, you know, there may be morphological properties to look at. It could be chem uh, acronyms are often not always jargon, uh, chemical formula. So those are things that you can um, use to look for jargon. So if we look, for example, the first thing you, you want to do probably is like find candidates, like what are, uh, uh, what are uh, terms that are likely to be jargon. So here, for example, you see this noun chunk. 
And another thing you then want to do is evaluate the, the context. So uh, remember when I said that uh, jargon has uh, typically a very well-defined meaning? Well, one way you could try to measure uh, measure what that means is uh, looking at the context, looking at the co-occurring words in, in, in all your documents and seeing how it's distributed. So if it's um, very peaked around just a small number of terms or a small like class of terms, um, then it's more likely to be jargon compare, compared to if it's a, word, a very common word, uh, it's probably used in uh, many more contexts, so the distribution of words is going to be less peaked. And uh, of course, to know whether it's jargon, you also want to know whether it actually does contain a lot of information. So um, you might also look at, all right, what's actually, uh, how would I actually explain this uh, to someone uh, who is like a lay person with respect to this uh, discourse community? So, um, there's a lot of work on paraphrase detection. You could also try to use uh, external information to try to see, all right, I know that all these things mean the same thing for some external reason, and therefore I'm going to see, uh, you know, where, where's the jargon and where's the broader, the longer, long form explanation. So those are all, uh, you know, very nice. Uh, there, there's a lot of information out there on on jargon detection, on, uh, on paraphrase detection and document similarity. But what I want to focus on uh, is how uh, we should think about uh, support, actually building this, actually uh, supporting uh, formation of a discourse community. So when you're designing solutions uh, to support the formation of a discourse community, for example, it's very important that you remember who's the expert. Uh, the design uh, encapsulates a lot of assumptions and choices about who is the experts on something and uh, problems can happen, for example, when the software engineers and the data scientists designing NLP solutions uh, design it in a way that information sort of flows from their, them, their assumptions to the people using it. That can be, for example, if you say, I want to standardize formulation uh, and therefore, I'm going to have like a drop down menu of choices that people can use to sort of reduce their uh, reduce the variability. The problem there is that uh, the people who are using it are the actual experts and they may not find all their expertise and uh, the kind of way they want to express themselves in the choices that you're giving them. So it's important to always just have opinions on where you have knowledge. So we have knowledge about uh, lingu the, the language and, uh, you know, the, the kind of, uh, maybe the kind of linguistic formulation you want, but uh, not about the actual information that goes in. So I would like to close out with some uh, general things to, uh, to consider, uh, and that went into our considerations when, uh, uh, when developing this work. Uh, and that's that you don't want to be too pres prescriptive, as I said, uh, but you do want to promote good patterns of communication. So uh, that can mean like soft suggestions of uh, including times or dates when it's appropriate or mentioning uh, a responsible party for uh, a thing to do, for example, but soft suggestions only. Um, so, and that ties into, you don't want to leave users without guidance of, or structure. Um, so you do want to, uh, you know, uh, propagate uh, best practices, but um, it's very important that you make sure that they still have the freedom to express themselves in new ways. Because, you know, things may change. You may start to do business in another market and all the assumptions that were true uh, in, in previous uh, places don't hold again, or maybe something like COVID happens and you need to, you know, uh, give them the flexibility to like seamlessly incorporate that new information. Um, you also don't want to blindly reproduce things without opinion though. So think an opinion can be jargon is good, uh, but jargon has to be uh, well-defined and specific and mean the same thing everywhere. 
that's an opinion you can measure uh, as an attack person. Um, and that's something that you probably want to somehow feature in, uh, in your solutions. Uh, but you do want to make sure that you still keep learning from the people who do the uh, actual work because they're the people who actually understand jargon. So you don't want to um, have a too harsh and too uh, definitive way of rejecting uh, input if you think it doesn't uh, conform with your assumptions. Thank you very much. Um, I uh, hope you had as much uh, fun thinking about this as I do. Um, and uh, yeah, I would like to know if you have questions.